social scientists. And for this week, that view might be um, reinforced because what we're going to do this week. Well, hang on, that's just said that it's started now. So what we're going to do this week is talk about the basics of ethics. And then next week, what I'm going to try and do is put that into context for you. In other words, why the heck are we doing this? The practicalities of ethics are things that we tend sometimes not to think about too much. But of course, it's clear that these things apply in real life. Anyone who's been watching the news in the last week will have seen uh, reports about a vote that took place at Westminster. An MP was guilty of uh, taking money to lobby. He was found guilty by uh, a committee of his peers. And yet his party chose to vote to overturn that decision and to pretend that they were doing it because the procedure itself is unfair, despite, of course, the procedure having been in place for many years. It was all there was an outcry over that decision. That people say this was just completely unfair. It was only after that that many of those self same MPs who had voted for this clearly incorrect decision came out to say, well, we were misled. Our leaders told me to do something and, and we were wrong. Cabinet ministers were on television saying, well, I didn't actually read it. I just voted for it. That shows incredibly poor ethical judgment. To simply do something because somebody's told you to, that's just stupid. To not spend time to familiar yourself, familiarise yourself with an issue, but just go with the flow because your pals have told you to is stupid. My mum and no doubt many adults in your lives when you were wee said, if your pal jumped off a cliff, would you jump off as well? Well, those MPs did. In fact, they were told to jump off a cliff and they all held hands and jumped. And they only regretted it later. We make decisions based on an ethical foundation. We may not think about it as being that, but we do. And one of the things I want to do in, over the next couple of weeks is allow us to examine what that ethical foundation is, how we think about ourselves as ethical people, what our ethics are, and how that will then translate into getting a job and what we do in that job. So that's the idea of this. It's not about taking a course in philosophy, although you could do worse. It is, however, about trying to understand ourselves, trying to understand different options for ourselves, and trying to understand how we would act at particular times, in particular circumstances, and whether or not we'd be able to live with ourselves afterwards. James has put uh, a reference to the Patriot Act in the in the comments. And of course, that was another bad piece of legislation put in in America. And I'm going to be slightly more um, understanding about it. It was a bad act, of course it is. It should never have been voted in. But in that particular case, it was shortly after 3,000 people had died in New York. The people were stunned. What also happened, of course, was people used that not to change things to protect themselves against that happening again, but they also used it to put into place things that they'd wanted to do for a long time. And that's where the issues start to particularly uh, building. 
So does all of that make sense? We all on board with that. Yep, all happy. Uh, James, you're talking about the video on absolutism and pluralism. Um, they're the ones on Moodle. As you know, we're moving away from Moodle, so I haven't updated them. But if you go to the module materials contained in the OneNote, I've given updated videos in there. OK, I thought I'd hidden all the ones that had uh, had disappeared, but clearly not. So lots of people in the chat coming up with other issues, other cases like NSA and Snowden and uh, Chelsea Manning would come under that uh, heading. In the UK, there have been whistleblowers here as well, whistleblowers after the Falklands conflict where people released uh, documents saying that uh, ships were sunk even though they had broken off conduct uh, con yeah, broken off conflict and had been sailing away and that was hms belgrano now it wouldn't have been hms but it was a belgrano and stephen has asked a question about whether the moodle replacement is better and given that this is being recorded, I am not going to say anything. OK, so let's start thinking about ethics. What we mean by ethics and how they apply to us. OK, so what we want to do, as I said, is look at different schools of thought regarding ethics, um, but to try and use them in the prism of the 21st century. Um, because all through history, people have said, oh, we don't need to know about this anymore because we're in a new age, new times. But of course, the concepts apply in different areas as well. So what we want to do is think about um, different ethical approaches, see whether they link up to our approach and whether or not we are flexible in our approach to ethics and our approach to other people's ethics. Because all of that comes under the generic heading of professionalism. And in fact, if you go and look at some of the codes of conduct that I pointed you to when we're talking about professional institutions, very often they come under both codes of conduct and codes of ethics. So they're very much intertwined. There's a question in the in the comments about whether whistleblowers are ethical or unethical. And someone's replied saying, we will find out soon enough. And I want to be really, really clear. You won't. Because I can't give you the answer. As far as I'm concerned, there is no the answer. Some of the stuff we'll look about we'll look at in these lectures, we'll touch on people who think there is an answer, and that's the one that we go for. That's not a view to which I subscribe. It may be one to which you subscribe, and it may be one that you change or move to, depending what we get out of this. But for all of these questions, for all of these things, this isn't about me telling you stuff. This is about me asking you questions. And you'll probably remember because I know that you read it all in great detail. 
But in the student information, I was very clear about how this will work. It's our job to challenge you. It's our job to give you options, to give you different thoughts, to give you different approaches. But it can't be our job to tell you which one is right. It absolutely is our job to challenge you. Oddly enough, and that, that has nothing to do with what we think. So you will be challenged. And I guarantee you that whatever you say, I will say it's wrong. Because that's what we are here for, to make you examine yourselves and to make you question what is right. So in there, when we talk about engaging with the modules, hey, it's not that one. So that was so good. I'd, I'd got to the end of the sentence just as I was going to point you to it and then realise I was pointing to the wrong page, which is a bit annoying. <sighs> Trust me, in the student information, there's a page that talks about just that, about how you'll be challenged, about how it's our job to do that, and it may or may not be anything that we believe but it absolutely is something that you need to be challenged on because you need to be challenged on everything in order for you to properly examine yourself. The TLDR, we are the devil's advocates. That's what we're here for and that's what we'll do. And the last comment is the words that you will hear more than anything over the next couple of weeks. It depends. All of these things depend. And one of the things that we'll talk about as we're going through the lecture is the idea that our set of ethical standards can actually change over time and on the circumstances. OK, so the page I was talking about is interactions. We are going to challenge you. If you don't like it, well, I'm sorry. But I'm not sorry. That's what we're here for and that's what we will do. So, on that basis, as we are talking about what we do and how we act, um, let me start by getting an idea of where you come from. And I don't mean geographically. I mean in terms of the way you approach an issue. Do you always do using your head or your heart? Do you feel things or do you analyse things? Are you a rational human being? I've pressed the button and I'm hoping a poll's coming up, but I'm not seeing it in my screen. Is anybody seeing it out there? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I see it. Seems to be taking an age for anything to happen. Okay, so. 
fill in the form. Are you a rational person? Oh, somebody's having a party. Yeah. One of the issues that we have is that um, the idea that we are rational assumes that we have a set of rules. And of course, a set of rules that other people with which other people agree. Because you can only be rational where your uh, responses are within a specific framework. And that framework may be different for you or for someone else. Um, I'm assuming you're hearing me because my system is just incredibly slow. If, you, if you're not hearing me, shout some of the chat, whatever. You do cut out fairly often. Uh, I'm wondering whether to cut my losses and try and restart again, because this is quite poor. Perhaps try uh, disabling video. I don't think it's a, a bandwidth issue. Because a bandwidth issue wouldn't stop what's happening here, which is my computer grinding to a halt as I try and look at Task Manager to see if there's something happening in the background. I started Task Manager before I started talking about this poll, and it's still not appeared on my computer. Right, as I did last week, give me two minutes. I am going to restart and hope for the best here. And you guys can fill out that poll while I'm away. Oh, and now my comments feed has gone as well. Nor will my restart button appear. I hate patch Tuesdays. Assuming that's what it is. And if you are still hearing me, by the way, I tried to turn off video when whoever it was suggested it, and it still hasn't turned off, which just shows you how slow this machine actually is. I also pressed the restart button about a minute ago and nothing's happening. We really are going well.
Hello. Hi. I am back. Let's see how long this lasts. Right, sorry, just opening everything up again. So how did you on with the poll? How do you see yourselves as You guys have been chatting away, I need to scroll back quite a bit. Yeah, I can use the website Teams, but actually it gives me fewer um, options in terms of sharing and putting up my PowerPoints and all that kind of stuff. So I need to use the... Um, I need to use the application version. Don't seem to be that much faster, do I? I'm trying to scroll back through the the chat to see what you guys have been saying while I've been away, and it's uh, just not wanting to do it. I think you need a new PC. <laughs> I think you're right. Mine's, mine's, mine's has been the same. Mine's is blue screen in there. Since I was um, upgraded for Windows 7 to 10, it started blue screening. It's handy. No, oh, I know. Well, that's that's what they say. They say that when they, that when they do that, but obviously Windows, Microsoft want you to get a new PC up to Windows 11. Okay. Um, okay. Most of the chat seems to be about. Um, Most of the chat seems to be about how slow uh, Teams is, and I'm certainly not going to challenge you on that one. OK, so I'm trying to understand where you're coming from in terms of making decisions, because you're going to have to make decisions all the time. And when we do that, we are responsible for what we decide to do just like those MPs, even though they're whining now and trying to say, well, a big bad prime minister did it and ran away. They still made that choice. They had the choice of what to vote for, and they made that choice. And now they're being held responsible for their actions, and they don't like it. Most of us like to think that we make well-informed decisions. Part of the reason those MPs were so castigated was that they came right out and said, well, we didn't make any sort of informed decision. We didn't even read the documents. We didn't read the motion. We didn't read the outcome. We just voted for what somebody told us to vote for. Hopefully you won't be in that uh, pool of people. Hopefully you will make decisions that you can defend. Oh, there goes chats again. Because most of us like to think that we are rational, that we, we do things for the right reasons. Um, that we, we weigh up our options, we decide what's best, and then once we've taken into account all the 
competing factors, we make the choice on what we're going to do. And that's how most of us see ourselves and that's how most of us would like to be. I wonder how true that is in real life. Do we ever let emotions cloud our judgment? Do we ever take decisions based not on the facts, but on how we feel? I mean, I've just asked you that question and I'd love to know what the answers are, but I can't see them on my screen. Um, I would suggest that we would have to be particularly cold people to not ever take into account our feelings. Or let me be more precise in my language, to not let our feelings intrude on our decisions, because often we don't realise that that's what we are doing. It just happens. Right. Let me just shut that tab down in case that's slowing me down at all. Because Firefox seems to be taking a quite a bit of space. So. What do you think about yourselves? Is that what you do? Do you always take rational decisions? Or do you occasionally let your emotions jump in? It's going to be a very long day if these polls are going to take this long to, to jump up. This is ridiculous, isn't it? OK, 9% of people said always, 80% of people said sometimes, 5% of people said rarely, and 0% of people said never. Thank you. Right, I'll go in with the lecture and see if we can get back to some of those polls later. I see I do have more of them. They're, um, they are not happy with me at the moment. Teams is just taken. Oh man, Teams has taken eighty-eight percent CPU. Now it's dropped back to 18, <laughs> and yet it's still not doing anything. There's nothing. Networks at 0% do nothing. Why are you not working, you stupid application? The green screen that you have going is uh, is causing some issues. I use it every time though. But let's give it a go. Let's try something else. Usually I know that it is taking issues because that's where the CPU kicks in to try and do the blanking of the background and the overlay. But I'm not seeing any CPU issues at the moment. It's absolutely fine. I've been doing this every week since the start of term. I don't know why it's suddenly decided. It's upset with you guys. You must have upset it somehow. That, of course, was a completely rational comment and I did not let my heart overtake my head for one second. 
Oh, there's chat. Do you think, think, do you think that think Teams that... is making irrational decisions? <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> okay, let's turn off the overlay and see if that helps. I mean, genuinely, I'm, I'm, I mean, you're seeing what I'm sharing, but I'm on Teams. And I can't even scroll in the Teams interface. It's just ridiculous. OK, we might not be able to get polls. So this idea that we um, are working within our own ethical framework has been around for a long time and of course that's been extended out to people trying to decide that ethical frameworks shouldn't just be personal they should be universal or at the very least apply to everyone in a, a particular group whatever the group might be a religious group a national group a, a color group a sex group uh whatever it happens whatever however you want to split up people People have decided that there are different uh, rules that apply to those groups. Those sorts of choices have been made for a long time. And um, it's important that we understand that that's been happening because, of course, those decisions, those rules, that people put in place for themselves, quite often they try to impose on other people. And sometimes we might be happy about that. But other times we might not be as keen on someone else's ethical framework as we are on our own. So there are competing ethical frameworks for people who want to do different things or who feel themselves bound by different rules. That said, there's plenty of things that people will perhaps decide that are universally wrong. And we'll talk about what they might be later. But it's fair to say that there is no ethical framework to which everyone subscribes. But if we all have those frameworks, if we all have decided that there is a, a set of boundaries for us and people like us, the first thing we have to decide is whether we actually have the right to make those decisions. What is our moral status to make that decision either for ourselves or for someone else? It's called moral status in the, in the jargon. And I'm not even talking about whether something's right or wrong. And you'll see that on the slide, they're very much in inverted commas. Because I couldn't tell you what's right and wrong at the moment. There are some things I would point to that are right, and there are some things that I would point to that are wrong, and there's a whole pile of stuff in the middle that I'm not going to pretend that I can say. I'll have my view, but I'm self-aware enough to know that my view may or may not be um, the right answer, even if there is one. So the first thing we have to think about is think about that idea of moral status. Do we even have the right to think about those things in the first place? Sorry, I'm just getting this link. I will be with you. It's just very slow. I may have mentioned that before.
And one thing that is true, my computer is incredibly hot. So while this is running, I'm going to try and um, pull my blinds down, see if I can get this computer to be in the shade. Genuinely, nothing. 2% disk, 0% network, 10% GPU, 23% CPU. This is just... <sighs> so weird. What the heck? Some weird reason my Wi-Fi download speed is currently at 360 kilobytes per second, which is more than my upload speed. What is it doing? Yeah, that was why I closed the, the student information tab, because that's the only one I don't normally have open. The other ones are just ones I have open every week, because I use them all the time. My name is Jeff Sebo. And I, teach and I teach animal and environmental studies at New York University. Today, Today, I'm going to talk to you about moral status. In other words, I'm going to talk to you about who we have moral obligations to and why. Let me start with a quick example to show you what I mean. Imagine that you broke into my room and you ripped that head off my teddy bear. Most people would think that you acted wrongly. But why? Who did you wrong? Not my teddy bear. Teddy bear right there is a bunch of cloth. Instead, most people would say that you acted wrongly because you wronged me as somebody who cares about this teddy bear. So the question is, what marks the difference between me and my teddy bear? What makes it the case that you have moral obligations to me, but not to my teddy bear? 
This is the question of morals. Now, historically, most philosophers have thought that the difference between me and my teddy bear is that I'm a human being and my teddy bear is not. In other words, most philosophers have thought that all and only human beings have moral status. But, but why? What makes us so special? Well, many people like Rene Descartes and by saying that we have rationality or language or self-awareness or some other very sophisticated cognitive capacity. This is what makes us special and this is what gives us moral status. But recently people have started to question the idea that all and only human beings have these capacities. For example, Peter Singer argues that no matter which capacity we pick, we can always find some non-human animal, like say a chimpanzee, who has that capacity more than some human being, or severely disabled. disabled human being. In fact, it turns out that the only property that all and only humans seem to have is membership in the species homo sapien. But if we say that all and only human beings have moral status for them, then how are we any different at all from racists or sexists or anybody else who discriminate against others solely on the basis of membership in a particular biological category. For that reason, Richard Ryder, Peter Singer, Tom Regan, and many other philosophers have argued that speciesism is wrong for the same reason that racism and sexism are. They are all forms of prejudice in favor of one group over another group solely on the basis of membership in a particular biological Category. Denison puts the point this way. To see why speciesism is wrong, imagine an alternate history where Neanderthals survived as a distinct, reproductively isolated species. So in this world, human beings and Neanderthals live together and work together and play together and are exactly alike in every respect except that they happen to be these. Now imagine that in this world, you discover that your roommate or your best friend is a Neanderthal instead of a human being. Would this mean that you lose all of your moral obligations to this person? Would you now be morally permitted to use them for food or clothing or research or whatever purpose you had in mind? Intuitively, no. You would still have moral obligations to your roommate or best friend. And what this shows is that membership in this species species homo sapien is not in and of itself what gives us moral status. So then what is? What does give us moral status? Well, one option is to say that rationality or language or self-awareness gives us moral status, but this is that many human beings, like infants and severely disabled human beings, lack moral status because they lack these capacities, and that view seems deeply implausible to many people. So for that reason, many philosophers have argued that we should expand the circle of moral concern by saying that senti, or in other words, the capacity for conscious experiences like pleasure and pain, is what gives us moral status. This view would imply that the vast majority of human beings and many non-human animals have moral status. And many people find this view plausible because they... because they say that you need to be sentient in 
in order for it to matter to you how your life goes for you. So Peter Singer uses the example of kicking a rock versus kicking a mouse down the street. He says, rock is not sentient, and so a rock will not suffer if you kick it down the street. So you have no moral obligation at all not to kick a rock down the street. On the other hand, a mouse is sentient, so a mouse will suffer if you kick them down the street, and so you do have a moral obligation not to kick the mouse down on the street. Other philosophers think that we should expand the circle of moral concern even farther by saying that life itself is moral status. So this view would imply that all living organisms have moral status. That includes human beings, non-human animals, plants, even maybe species or ecosystems if we decide that those things are alive. And many people think that this view is plausible because they say that our preference for sentience is no different from a preference for human beings or, say, white people or men. These are all forms of prejudice for one group over another based solely on membership in a particular biological category. As Kenneth Goodpaster puts the point, sentience or the capacity to have conscious experiences, is only one tool that evolution gave us in order to survive and reproduce. So why should morality privilege those of us who happen to survive by experiencing pleasures and pains over other living organisms who happen to survive and reproduce in other ways? Now, obviously, which of these theories of moral status we accept is going to have profound implications for how we live our lives. For example, if we decide that animals or plants have moral status, then it will turn out that a lot we currently do in everyday life is deeply morally problematic, including but not remotely limited to the fact that we currently kill over 60 billion non-human animals a year for food alone. Now, at this point, it might be very tempting to say, okay, maybe all and only humans have moral status after all, because our lives would be much more true. But keep in mind that 100 years ago or 200 years ago, it might have been very tempting for white men to say, okay, maybe all and only white men have moral status after all, because their lives would be much easier if that were true. And what that shows is that which theory of moral status we accept has to depend on which theory of moral status seems possible and not on which theory of moral status happens to be most convenient for us. It may be deciding that morality is much more demanding than we might have hoped, but as my college ethics professor Richard Galvin said, no one ever said that this stuff was easy. So what do you think? Which theory of moral status seems most plausible to you? Do you think that all and only human beings have moral status and we can kick animals down the street if we want to? That all sentient animals have moral status? So at least we can kick plants down the street if we want to? Or do you think that all living organisms have moral status?
Well, this is going to win. Couldn't stop the video. Couldn't stop teams. I'm restarting the game. So the machine is doing the same thing. I have something in my startup, what we just called program, which doesn't seem suspicious at all. And so we'll remove that. And I'm certainly looking at a, a blue screen that won't even restart because it says task manager stop and not restarting. I'm really doing well today. OK, so I'll log out on this and hopefully my computer comes back on sometime soon. I'll see you on there.
I don't know if you can hear me, but my hard disk is sitting at 100% and I've no idea why. Yeah, I'm having You can hear me. Can somebody come on microphone and just say hello? Because I've no idea. Hello, we can hear you. Aye. Hello, we can hear you. Yeah, hi, hi. Hello, can you hear me? Thank you. For a long time, there. Um, Anyone else lost him again? Ah, he's went again. Yep. Yeah, yep, yeah. he's gone. Lost.
Welcome back. Oh, can you guys see me? Because I've just got a connecting up in the screen. Very jerky. Yeah, I can. Teams has already crashed. And I think I've mentioned before, I don't know if it was to you guys, but when Teams crashes, it says, well, sorry about the glitch. We have restarted. It wasn't a glitch. You crashed and you crashed hard. Own it. I'm still at the connecting page. I'm looking at my resources, they're all fine. Disk, Wi-Fi, CPU, GPU, there is nothing. It is just Teams. Whatever it's doing, it is not a happy bunny. I did see something in the chat before it died about whether it had been upgraded. I actually don't know if there had been an automatic update. One of the things I was doing when I was away was checking updates and stopping it doing them in case it was doing something in the background, but it didn't seem to be. Yeah. Apart from memory, which is up at 80%, which is fine. There's nothing taking any, any resources at all. And yet Teams won't even show me the screen. I'm still on the connecting screen. And I'm sitting here thinking, am I even talking to myself? Or is there something happening? This is just ridiculous. You are being heard. I think it's recording again. Yeah. No, it's, in theory, it has never stopped recording. So even when I was away, whatever you guys were saying about me was recording. So I'll go back to it and check. See what horrible thing. Oh, I've got a screen. <coughs> kind of got a screen. Just out of interest, can you only hear me or can you see me as well? Can't see you. So I can't see anything on my screen. I don't have the button yet so that I can share the PowerPoint. Sorry folks, this has felt like a massive waste of the last hour and a half. Still, anybody watch the rugby at the weekend? Good, wasn't it? Haven't been into much sports since um, uh, a certain man by the name of Suarez handballed um, during a World Cup. I'm sure it was an accident. There's no way Suarez would have been, a, would have uh, done that deliberately. Now this is just stupid. I'm going on to other devices to see what's going on and I can get stuff up almost immediately. Same as when I come onto the phone to connect. I have no idea what this is. Depending on how this goes, um, don't forget that on the module materials, there are links to last year's lectures. 
so you can always catch up there. I will try and get through this stuff, obviously. Uh, we'll see how far we get today. If you want to do other stuff, remember it's on there, as are the links to the videos that I've shown and the other videos that are referenced. They are all linked to the module materials. Actually, if you open up OneNote, you can even watch them within OneNote. I know somebody asked the question. I don't know if you can hear me because I used to have stuff up and it's gone away now. Can hear you, but your your videos do shooting about two frames per second or something. Amazing, it's going that many. I've just suddenly had about I don't know. I've got a full screen of notifications, which are all you guys' chats while I was away. It's just catching up in all the chat, so my screen just went <clears throat> with all these different things on it. Clearly catching up on itself. Ooh. I can scroll on the main Teams interface, which is an update. Oh, was that against Ghana, James? I didn't actually remember. Joe, Joe. OK, OK, now it's working. I believe it was the 2010 World Cup and it was the last time Ghana placed anywhere decent um in a world cup um, in and his world handball world. ensured that we wouldn't reach the quarterfinals Oof. no wonder you're upset save the goal when the penalty was missed you know what that means. Uh, I can't yeah. see any of you guys on screen. I've got no video. I've got no chat. I can't share my screen. Out of curiosity, because lecturers are struggling, uh, are we getting compensation for our marking? I think that's a no. <laughs> I think it'd be very fair. True, but fair is also a moral concept that will need to be discussed. What is fair, really? <laughs> James out here bringing it back to the real questions. What can I say? I I I love I love um, uh, ethical discussions because they always they always boil down to either it depends or hmm, maybe you're asking the wrong question. <laughs> well, that depends. Personally, I would define fair as like a standard of teaching quality, and if we're not meeting that, then it would be unfair.
if that were the case, then we should probably just all graduate like the this next couple of years with um, distinctions all around one plus because the entire education system has been turned upside down in a manner that is categorically not the standard we are supposed to be getting and therefore unfair. Welcome back. I'll have to take your word for it. I'm just seeing it connecting again. Um, Kieran uh, was uh, uh, discussing his um, the the, the uh, ethical um, characteristics of fairness. I was more curious if we'd be getting compensated in the marketing for the, mark. the uh, uh, lecture issues. Lecture issues? Nope. Because, of course, you're already supposed to have watched this lecture before you got here, because it's been recorded from last year and gone through all the materials. And, of course, you know, you don't pay for the course in the first place. So that's. A... Well, I do. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I do as well, yeah. Sorry about that. Well, if it helps, this wouldn't be my choice either. Oh, something's coming up in the screen. It's a shame we've not, not had a chance to get to um, utilitarianism uh, and then uh, deontology. Because that would have been fun. <laughs> I'll make sure we do, don't worry. You won't miss out. I will cover the stuff. Whether it's this week or next week, it will get done, I promise. You don't go off that easy. I just have no clue why it's doing this. I can't see anything going wrong at all. Anything. Sorry? So are we calling the lecture quits until the labs start? Well, I'm hoping to get through something. Just depends whether this crashes on me again. Every time I start it up, it just crashes out again. I'd quite like to get through some material so that you've got something to take into the tutorials. But don't worry, make sure the lecturers know when you get a break. Thirty-three percent CPU, one percent disk, zero percent network, twenty-seven percent GPU. There's just nothing unusual. There's nothing happening. What is this? Oh. Am I sharing now? Is it telling me you're sharing? You seeing it? Let's see it. Hey. OK, so. We have to think about, in essence, what right we have. To make these kinds of decisions in the first place, and that's where the 
the moral status thing comes in. But one of the things that I want you to think about, and there would be a poll put up at this point, but I'm not even going to attempt it, is whether there are things that um, are fundamental, that are so out of the, well, it's nothing to do with moral codes, it's just how we should be. And similarly, are there anything, are there any behaviours that no matter what your culture, what your moral code, where you're from, what your beliefs are, are there any things that transcend that? So just quickly in the in the comments, now that I'm seeing them again, are there any things that transcend societies as a, as a, are there things that everyone, no matter where or what background, could agree were either right or wrong? Kieran's talking about murder, but immediately points out that we do have soldiers and most countries have gone to war at one point or another. I'm sure there'll be murderers out there who feel they were morally justified in doing what they did. I'm sure you're right. So it is difficult. There was a society whose belief system included the idea that they had to sacrifice newborn babies in order to get a new, a, a good crop. So they would go and throw them off a cliff. There are many societies who thought that killing newborn babies was a good idea. Although in ancient Greek times, quite often children were taken up onto a hill and left there. If they survived long enough, they were decided, it was decided that they were um, strong enough to be accepted into Greek society. And they were brought back down. But if they weren't, they died on the hill. Again, you'd find it hard to come across a modern day uh, civilization that would approve of something like that. I don't want to say anything too much, but it seems to have caught up. It seems to be going quickly. I can even see myself move. So, I think we can agree that different people have different moral codes, different moral standards, different ways of thinking and believing. And the question then becomes, how do we cope with that knowledge? Because if different people have different thoughts about how they should behave, do we move to a point where we make everyone conform to the same set of rules? Or do we let everyone do exactly as they want to do no matter what? James is saying the concept of right and wrong is universal. I'm not sure that it is. There are, there are moral frameworks that insist that there is no such thing as right or wrong. Partly because who are we to judge? Okay, any questions on that? Okay, in that case, this idea that um, we have different frameworks 
and that different uh, frameworks will be used by different societies, by different groups and societies. There is no one concept of right or wrong. That's called ethical relativism. And if there are different rights and wrongs, if there are different ways of uh, looking at things, how do we say, how do we decide which one of those is correct? And is that even a thing that we can do? Again, who are we to decide um, who's is right. So James has said that a concept is universal. So I've put up a question. Is there a base ethical framework that we can all say, yep. So yes, and you know what it is. is. Yes, but you'd struggle to describe it. No, but we could probably all agree on one or no, and it would be impossible to create. So what do you think? Come on, I know many people are in this class. I want you all to respond. I'd like to think a Star Trek style utopia is possible, but then I also realize that America exists. Well, you're saying a Star Trek style utopia. It doesn't seem utopia for all those red shots that you beam down onto the planet never to be seen again. We, we go for post Roddenberry. Uh, as Benjamin Sisko would say, um, there is no hunger in paradise. Uh, while he was in Bajor suffering under threat of the Dominion, they don't exist in a utopia. They only believe they do because Earth is like rich and bountiful, but all the other colonies don't agree. <laughs> Bajor is not part of the Federation at the point which Sisko says that in ds like but they are surrounded by a lot of um, former um, Federation colonies that were that are currently occupied by the Marquis. I feel as though we've hit your level now. It's good to know. Um, so we're looking at this poll results. Some of you think that you can have a framework but you wouldn't know what it is most of you think no and of those who think no you're reckoning that you couldn't even create one whether Gene Rodenberry helps you or not so we're at that point now where we've got lots of different ethical frameworks they disagree on a lot of fundamental points and um, agree probably on a lot more. If, if I had to come up with two words to describe what a lot of these frameworks say, it's be nice. Be nice to people, be nice to things, be nice. And then that's quite often what it comes down to. But we will differ in the detail, even though we might agree on the major aspects. Because we each have our own perspective, we each have things that we want to do, we each have uh, particular interests and things that are, we think are more important than others. The question is, can we live with those other things? At the moment we live in a place where we have ethical relativism. We accept and acknowledge that not everyone 
has the same ethical framework. But we do our best to have a society where we accept those and do not try to impose one specific set of values on everyone. That would be absolutism. Instead, we try and understand and accept all of those different values. And that it's possibly impossible to actually come up with this framework, as you guys have said. No one, when you responded to that poll, said, yes, we can have a framework and I know what it is. Less than a third of you thought that we could, but you couldn't actually define it. And the rest of you thought no. So we come up with this idea that, well, rather than try to define it, well, let's accept that there are differences. Let's try to incorporate those differences and come up with base level stuff. Things that um, will allow us to have different um, views on lots of different things without forcing other people to be part of those views. So, for example, there's another quick poll for you. Which of these is true for you? While you're answering that question, my computer seems to have caught up in itself. Whatever it was doing, it seems to be fine now. Oh, I hate computers. I'm in the wrong business. So we're currently looking at responses about what your eating habits are. And I'm not seeing uh, any vegetarians or any vegans. I don't usually see any vegans apart from anything else. They, they tend not to have enough energy to press the buttons. But normally we at least get some vegetarians. Most of you eat meat. I eat meat. But there are some people for whom that is a no-no. But we um, accept both points of view. We might try and place some sort of restrictions on it. If you're going to eat meat, can we have a, an ethical way of slaughtering animals? If that's even a thing, can you ethically kill something? Which is why I always say that um, Although I do eat meat, I don't buy meat. Instead, I pay the butcher conscience money. So that I don't have to go out and kill something and skin it and gut it and cut it up. I suppose the question then becomes, is that OK that I eat meat? And again, there's another video which I'm not even going to attempt to show you just now. If this was an hour ago, I would have done. But you can catch up to that in your own time. Again, it's in the module materials in the, uh, the ethics section. And it talks about what makes it OK to eat animals. And more generally, what makes something OK in that sense? Who says that we get to eat a cow? Certainly not the cow, I'm sure it has uh, strong views on the subject. Do we think we're better than the cow? That we are allowed to kill it and eat it? Do we do it just because we can? The cow can't stop us. Although again, I come back to the, the conscience money argument. It 
would you be able to kill a cow? Either physically or emotionally. But it leads us on to thinking about other things. All of you there are saying that you eat meat. Do we just do that because we can? And if that is the case, do we do other things just because we can? Do you grab things from a shop just because you can? There's a theory that Woolworths only went bust because nobody would stop stealing all the pick and mix. And where does this because we can line stop? Is it OK to sell an old person something that they don't want? An old person who maybe doesn't have much money and maybe doesn't even understand what's going on. Is it OK to sell them something just because we can? In your job, and I'll remind you at the moment, going to university is your job. Is it OK to work slowly because we can? Is there a moral imperative to do the best we can or do we just say, no, oh, I'm, I'm fine, that's all right? And you can turn that on its head. If we do something because we can, what about where we choose not to do something? There's a story about St. Martin who um, came across a beggar on the road. And although he didn't have anything with him to give the beggar, he took his sword and the beggar thought that he was going to be killed. But instead, what St. Martin did was cut his cloak in half and gave half to the beggar. Do we not help people just because we don't have to? If you see someone choking or drowning, do you just ignore them because it's not our problem? Do you give your best work when you're asked to work with other people? Do you not bother because someone else will fill in? Someone else in the group will do what you didn't? Do you, when you're creating something, when you are at work, not worry too much about it because, you know, who cares? Sometimes that can lead to death, depending on the systems that you're working on. And I'll give you lots of examples of that if we hadn't wasted so much time on my computer. If we can decide if something's right or wrong, does that change depending on the time and the situation and where we are? One of the things that you identified earlier as being commonly thought of as wrong is murder. But murder is itself uh, an emotive term. You identify not wanting something to be murdered, but you're all eating meat. So you're OK for the cow to be murdered. So what you really mean is you don't want people to be murdered. But then I don't see any of you out on demos saying that we have to get rid of all our weapons and disband the army. So you're OK with the country killing people. So is killing different from murder? Is there a difference? When we look at law, it decides there's a difference. Murder is not the same as manslaughter. So we try and ascribe different levels of killing depending on what the purpose was, depending on what happened. And if we can do that for um, if we can do that in legislation, can we make that sort of decision in other spheres? If we can decide that if you kill someone accidentally, it's not as bad as killing someone when you mean to. What about the whole idea of um, helping someone to die? So there's a poll up on the screen just now. 
are there qualitative differences between each of those examples there? And if so, and you can choose multiple answers here if you like. Are there differences here between the idea of euthanasia for someone who's terminally ill at aged 80 to someone who's terminally ill aged 40? And I've just chosen 40 as a generic, not old, and you wouldn't think they would die at 40. If you prefer, replace it with 30, 50, or any other random number that you like. So immediately we're seeing differences. Some people are happy with euth euthanasia for an 80 year old with dementia but not with a 40 year old with early onset dementia. What exactly is the difference? Oh no, they've caught up now. But there is now a difference between the 80 year old who's terminally ill and the 40 year old who's terminally ill. Again, what's the difference? Where is that line? For some frameworks, there is no line. Ten Commandments, root of Christianity, baseline of Christianity, thou shalt not kill, full stop. Although you don't have to look far to see a lot of fundamentalist Christians who, for example, are very keen on having guns. I'm not sure why they've got the guns if they're not intending killing people, and if they are intending killing people, how does that fit with their thou shalt not kill part? Thou shalt not kill war. That's a very good question, actually. I've never thought about it in those terms before. It does just say thou shalt not kill. Now, when this was written, we're back to that whole moral status thing. The idea that you had to be a human to have moral status. Well, actually, when this was written, you had to be human, male, and of a certain age to have moral status. Children and women did not figure. But if we have moved on to um, accepting that women have these rights, that children have these rights, why doesn't it apply to thou shalt not kill sheep? In either case, what you're seeing, if you do have a different response to these, and I know that many of you have just said, nope, none of the above, it's never helpful. But if you're on the majority there who are saying, well, maybe sometimes, but not always, then what you're experiencing is moral relativism because 28 percent of you said it's okay to euthanize an 80 year old who's terminally ill but only 12 percent say that's acceptable if it's an 80 year old with dementia you are experiencing relativism so you've moved on from you won't kill to well it'll kill in certain circumstances that's where things, not surprisingly, get tricky. There's a nice video on it, but once again, I'm not going to show it to you, but it is linked. Because I'm well aware that we're heading towards quarter past three, although I feel as if I've only been lecturing for half an hour because I've only had a computer for half an hour. Anybody get any questions or any other comments that they want to put in just now? Uh, just to say about the thou shalt not kill thing, um, the way I was taught both in church and in uh, school, I went to a Catholic school, so there was Catholic lessons at uh, the 
for towards catechism and all that stuff. They have restrictions on the thou shalt not kill uh, in that it also includes character assassination. So, for example, canceling someone on Twitter technically is uh, included under thou shalt not kill. Um, also, uh, the 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 are, there are the whole thing of if God wants you to, which is in itself a very nebulous topic. Um, someone's mentioned the Crusades and stuff. Um, that was more political meandering than actually. Oh, I heard a thing from God. Um, but like the the doubt shall not kill, even in Christian canon, is very nebulous and full of like weird sort of. Um, twists and turns and stuff like that, just want to say. Yeah, there's a lot of relativism in it. I think I would be nervous about equating actually killing someone with the concept of um, shunning them, which is what a cancellation on Twitter is, uh, because shunning also has its own history and has been used for uh, centuries to ensure that people whose behavior has been beyond the pale are, are shunned by, to use a term that I wouldn't normally use, so very much in inverted commas, decent society. So I, I definitely wouldn't equate killing with shunning, but I take the point that there is definitely relativism uh, encapsulated in that. And one of the things that has changed in a lot of these frameworks is that they have been reinterpreted to um, apply in different ways at different times. Which is why, of course, you can have priests who turn up on a battlefield and tell people, yeah, it's OK to go and kill people. Even though. You know, one of the top 10 is don't kill people. So there's a lot of ethical relativism goes on in a lot of places. Any other questions or comments? James is pointing out that ostracism or shunning in ancient Greece was an incredibly uh, powerful weapon, which it was. And in fact, some people found it harder than being put to death to know that they were no longer welcome within society. And you see that now. And again, there's a, there's a the equation with killing people. There are many. Uh, prisoners who have been sentenced, for example, to life in prison, who proclaim loudly that they would actually rather die, would rather be executed. So, again, that is relative. Some people would rather stay alive no matter what the circumstances. Some people decide, nope, these circumstances are not for me, I would rather not have this. These are the sorts of things that you can chat about in your tutorial. Um, so I'm going to stop this recording. Now that everything's working fast again.